Welcome back to my Growing Joshua Trees from Seed Series. It's day 1340. I moved on from pyrethrin analog sprays to imidacloprid. Imidacloprid is the most popular insecticide worldwide. This one is from Bayer Advanced. It's sort of a gel, a white gel that you dissolve in a greater volume of water. So I haven't been following the instructions exactly. In some cases, I just kind of eyeball it and use this measuring cup lid, put it in an arbitrary volume of water, dissolve it, and pour it onto the soil or potting mix, which I'm trying to get rid of currently for all my plants. And that should get into the root system eventually over the course of weeks and provide systemic resistance to pests for several months or maybe even an entire growing season. Although, in my experience, it doesn't seem to quite get rid of everything. It seems to prevent fungus gnat larvae from taking root, taking a hold, as they were often under the crust of this uh, mango seed smoothie that you see on top that looks pretty gross. So it's day 1403. I saw some scale insects two months after that first imidacloprid treatment, and I'm going to do it again to see if I just need more uh, systemic resistance, more imidacloprid coursing through these hard blades or leaves of the Joshua tree. So it's been really cold in 2019, but despite that, my Joshua tree seems to be developing nicely. It's still wider than it is tall at this point, but it looks like the trunk is coming along nicely and I'm hoping it will thicken at some point. So if you look at this mango seed smoothie on top, it looks pretty gross. It's got, um, I think, mostly terrestrial algae. Um, I used to say it was moss, but I'm not quite sure. Maybe it is. Nah, I, I think it's like mostly mold, fungi, um, algae. So I'm using a floss stick again, the other end of it to remove the scaled insects. I don't know how people use this end of the floss stick to pick between their teeth. It seems a little bit too coarse. It's like a plastic arrowhead. So it's perfect though for my purposes. And typically on the smooth undersides of these leaves I just use the floss itself. But this will help with the scraping action and it's uh, disposable. So as you can see there are a few scale insects, but nowhere near the hundreds or maybe uh, low thousands that I had before. When I finally realized that these were pests, they weren't some sort of secretions, they weren't some sort of Joshua tree analog to human warts or moles in the skin. So you can see I've removed so many and the scars still remain on these old leaves. But the leaves still serve their purpose quite nicely and they're very green and hardy so I see no reason uh, neither aesthetic nor uh, functional to remove them. So I'm giving my Joshua tree a second imidacloprid treatment. Maybe those scale insects that I just scraped off, maybe the 15 or 20 or so were just holdovers from a bygone era that were hiding inside the folds of the main trunk so maybe that's it but just to be safe and prevent further infestations I'm going to treat this again and hopefully I'll never see scale insects again although I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for that to happen so it's day 1409 I visited Saddleback Butte State Park in Lancaster California I had never been here in my life this park was originally named Joshua Tree State Park that caused confusion. People confused it with Joshua Tree National Park, the much more famous one to the east in the Inland Empire. Although I guess um, this is sort of like the same kind of high desert and terrain as the Inland Empire. So Joshua trees have different phenotypes in different regions. The ones around Lancaster, California, in people's front yards and in the middle of the state park here tend to form these dense colonial colonies where offshoots from the rhizomes and roots just kind of pop up straight like that but I haven't seen any examples of them turning into a 
full-on trees that would uh, crowd and rub against um, their parent plants. So I don't know what this um, plant is, but it had very interesting leaves. It's sort of like some desert vegetable. It's very, um, it's fuzzy and very, very soft to the touch and surprisingly green and looks like it's full of water in such a harsh environment. So this is high desert and the soil here is very, very sandy. So as you can see here, this is as dense as many Joshua forests ever get. So it's a marginal habitat. You can see one here where some of them have died and um, in the distance it's uh, it's very peaceful to be in a place like this with very few people. This place is, compared to Joshua Tree National Park, it's practically deserted. So some of the trees on the lower uh, plateau, if you will, were very thick and tall. I think, if memory serves, some of these, um, none of them shown here really, because I saw the really big ones at the very end of the day after I had gone on a hike with my friend. Some of them were probably 30, 40 feet tall, probably around 30 feet tall, and the trunks were thick enough to rival that of any uh, deciduous tree or a forest tree in uh, a forest region. So this is beyond being sandy loam. The plants here are almost growing in pure sand. It's really, really soft to step on, and it's not just because it's all wet and muddy, it's just mostly sand. So sand has excellent drainage. Joshua Tree National Park isn't nearly as sandy here, but as I'm beginning to do more research on soil types and um, experiment with growing things in soil rather than potting mix myself, I found that just by from area to area, the, the soil really varies even in one locale. So this is a baby Joshua tree seedling, and it looks exactly like one of the ones I had growing in the very beginning of this video, well, this video series, and it was right in the middle of a trail. So um, most people wouldn't recognize that. I'm surprised it hasn't been stepped on, but this place doesn't seem much traffic. So at the end of the hike, you're on top of this Saddleback Butte, and you have a nice view overlooking all the farmland and the valleys. So it's it's very sparse and uh, dry up here. And the most surprising thing was there was no wind up here. Not really. It was just uh, bizarre how a place in Southern California like that would just have no wind in uh, open areas or in mountains. So it's day 1447. The uh, trunk is a little bit taller and time has passed and despite the cold weather the, these new blades just keep pumping out and pumping out and this neat funnel it's a very interesting plant and it's very tough as well so this has been going on for about four years as you can see the growth has been torrid by joshua tree standards or what we've seen so far by day 1490 the joshua tree was finally taller than it was wide huge milestone in my estimation there's this moth that won't leave it's just clinging to the underside of one of my blades so you can see the the trunks developing nicely the growth has been toward in 2019 despite the cold weather i think the growth had to accelerate at some point it can't be true uh, what they say in the literature about it growing 1.5 inches a year that's just way too slow but my circumstances, my conditions for the growth of this Joshua tree are vastly different from what a wild type Joshua tree would experience. So I'm applying a midocloprid for a third time and on day 1541, it's been 4.22 years of this series and four years since the first transplant. You can see there I have some sandy loam dug up from a construction site. Uh, this trash can already has some 50% sand, 50% clay soil in it. I ran out of the clay soil. But actually the sandy loam that I got that from um, in the new bag, that was basically in the same area, not 
a few hundred feet uh, or meters away. So it's pretty close by, and as I alluded to earlier, the soil composition can vary vastly if you just move over a few hundred feet, even in uh, the same area. So clay is more nutritious and holds more water, but it has low permeability to uh, gases. So if you have something that's more than 40% clay, um, a soil, then it's not going to breathe and then the roots are going to die because uh, they can't breathe or they'll just stop growing. So I'm going to start scooping out some of this uh, disgusting looking mango smoothie crust, mango seed smoothie. And it's just that and decomposed potting mix plus uh, whatever fungus gnat uh, corpses are in there. So this stuff, like I predicted to myself, is, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like a rotten consistency. It seems like really rich soil, but it's nothing like uh, charcoal-laden soil in uh, volcanic regions, nothing like that. So I also kind of suspected for the longest time that there are no roots on the surface, and that's uh, really borne out here, you know. So I finally started to get some get to some roots there and they seem just like mango roots in their uh, morphology and color. That was very surprising and I started to think uh, maybe all roots look like this but that's not the case at all. Like different plant species have different looking roots. So, so far I've seen a lot of those little um, reddish white mango looking uh, fine roots and they seem to be very very fragile um, but I'm really looking forward to see what's in here and as you can see it's just like wow there's uh, really really thick roots and they do look a lot like mango tree roots this one has curled uh, around in the cross pattern in the bottom it's just the way the the pot is shaped and you know typically people will say this has outgrown its pot and it's formed a root bowl but what I think is really going on is that's where the roots can breathe because they're next to all these uh, slits exposed to the air all the time in that watering tray. So I'm pouring in some of this new uh, sandy loam that I mixed again, half sandy loam, half sand. And sandy loam, uh, it has sand, silt, and clay in it, but there's a very low percentage of uh, clay and silt. So this is uh, different in color compared to the reddish stuff that I got from a few hundred feet nearby. I just took what I got. Um, I parked my car in that region and right next to it was a big, it wasn't a construction site like I said earlier. It was just um, for gardening purposes. Um, some landscape company just dug up this huge pile of dirt for a fence or some kind of landscaping project and they had a, a very rocky pile of sandy loam just piled up right next to where my car was parked. So that was a uh, low hanging fruit right there. I wasn't going to go carry 50 or 70 pounds of dirt in a cloth bag from uh, a remote site if I could just do it right next to the car. So I'm gently removing the dirt. Um, I've never needed to use a, a pick or anything like that. I don't want to even damage the roots, but I am breaking a lot of the roots here. And I have all this on fast forward because it's just simply too much to watch. But the, the key is just to be gentle and not to rip anything major. I've already ripped out so many of these uh, minor um, roots. And you know this thing is just... It's uncanny how much it looks like uh, the mango roots. So I peeled off uh, some of those dead leaves um, on this trunk. I was also shocked to see this trunk because I didn't know if there would be a trunk under the, the soil line, the potting mix line. And here we are. It's something that I can grab onto. It's really thick. So um, I have a lot of pride in this project. And uh, I, I feel really proud because uh, I've stuck through it and this has been pretty much the only plant to survive for this long. And uh, there's many reasons for that. I like it. It's a very interesting plant. It's slow growing, but 
at the same time I think um, its roots its root system is very adapted to low oxygen environments so I grew this in potting mix the entire way I transplanted um, this one seedling from the original uh, batch that I had so you can see all these uh, broken roots here I'll see what I can recycle for nutrients but as to what I was saying earlier um, if you mix in organic dead matter in your um, whatever you're growing stuff in that uses up oxygen as it decomposes and it's constantly decomposing and it does potting mix for example does not provide a, a proper anchorage for a tree so that's why this thing had a tilt for the better part of this four years um, and that happens to other people as well I, I've read people's testimonials so if you want your Joshua tree to go grow straight you have to have it in real soil which is a hundred percent mineral it's not uh, ten percent organic it's not even five percent or in in some cases it's not even one percent you know it's basically ground up granite so yeah sand and silt and clay are what will provide um, anchorage for your plant and I'll see what I can do here but I've removed um, well over 99 percent of the potting mix I realized that I just spilled some potting mix in the bottom there and I was uh, so tired and excited I didn't even remove it but that's okay as long as it's like one tenth of a percent or even less um, it'll make a drastic difference from uh, what I had going on before uh, just because this was doing well in potting mix recently doesn't mean that it'll do well forever as the decomposition gets advanced um, this thing will just basically fall over and uh, I don't think this species is susceptible to low oxygen root rot like a lot of other species and I think my evidence is um, pretty much in Joshua Tree National Park I see these growing not on slopes where the soil drains and gets oxygenated very easily this uh, tree tends to grow on the flat areas not not so much on the slopes so it, it's basically adapted to an environment where it's um, in my view mostly in like hard clays so that stuff can get rock hard it, it's not sandy in Joshua Tree National Park as it is in uh, the Saddleback Butte State Park so I think the Joshua Tree is um, it grows in high desert marginal environments but it can of course grow in a high oxygen sandy soil or or nearly pure sand but it can also do really well in places like Joshua Tree National Park where it's mostly um, like that reddish clay soil that I was talking about although I'm sure in Joshua Tree there's many different kinds of soils maybe all types are there so I think the Joshua Tree um, it's a very resilient plant and I've also heard read testimonials from some of my viewers that say yeah you can have this thing uh, tough it out and survive almost any kind of crappy conditions so it took me a lot of work to do all of this and this pot probably weighs uh, you know a good like 60 or more pounds maybe 70 pounds at least it's got to be 50 something it's very heavy and it took a long time to get all of that uh, the sand was easy I just got that bag for uh, like ten dollars from a big box store and now I'll try to recycle some of the nutrients from these uh, finer roots that I broke off and it's okay to have the organic stuff on top as long as there's enough aeration but in nature it it'd pretty much be leaves and branches and twigs and things like that and then the mycorrhizal fungi that form complexes with the roots will come up and decompose these things and feed the nutrients in exchange for sugars with the plant so it took me about 30 minutes to get to the watering after the transplant it's critical that you do this right away uh, a large tree for instance could probably die in like two hours if you don't uh, water it and just expose the roots like that so always do a saturation watering after transplanting in dry soil the the roots don't have a waxy covering like the the shoot system so it basically dries out right away especially if you plant it into bone dry uh, sand and dirt like I just did 
it'll just suck all the water right out. Knowing what I know now, it was the potting mix that was killing off all the roots for my Joshua tree seedlings back four years ago. It wasn't the overwatering as people like to say.